Nestling in the northwest corner of the Yorkshire Dales lies the small market town of Sedbergh. Until the coming of turnpike roads and the railways in the last century, it was one of the most remote places in England, accessible only by pack horse across the rolling fells. The astonishing beauty of the area echoes that of the neighbouring Lake District, but with more than a hint of Scottish ruggedness. The border is just 60 miles north. The house detectives faced their latest challenge, to solve another mystery from the past. We'd been called in to unravel the puzzling history of an old chemist shop in Sedba's main street. It's home to Jackie and Chris Holton. Jackie is a pharmacist and runs the shop, while Chris is a civil engineer and commutes across the dales to his job in Leeds. In the shop, Jackie employs two assistants, Christine and Lorna, who's expecting her first baby. Judith, the first impressions? Certainly looking at this facade, hints of Victorian plus, quite a bit of the 20th century too. And this, yes, this front bit looks very Dickensian to me. Hi, are you Jackie? Hello there, yeah. Juliet. Hi. How do you do? Hi, Hello. Jackie. Hello. 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 Oh, come on in. Thank this you. This is in the back there. It's a lovely spot. Yes, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we first came here 18 months ago and we couldn't believe it when we walked in. It hadn't been touched for 70 years. Things were hidden behind wallpaper, lots of old features. It was really exciting, wonderful atmosphere. Local people have told us the house really wasn't that old, but just got this gut feeling that bits of it could well be ancient, but I've got no evidence of that. I'd like to find out really who, who lived here and what they did and how each room and each floor was used. We know that the pharmacy here has been here for 100 years, but we don't know what it was before that. Well, local people have told us that Bonnie Prince Charlie hid in the chimney down in the cellar. Um, it'd be lovely to find out if this was true. Chris and Jackie were also mystified by the extraordinary side elevation of their house. We've got the curious number of 13 windows here, all filled in, either with uh, stone or, or with brick, and you know, we've got no apparent view. No, it's a, a narrow alleyway, and you've got all these hoods and sills that are projecting from the wall. It's, it's very strange. It's, it's spooky, actually, <laughs> to find something like this. The other mystery, Mac, is our chimney which we believe to be the only one like this in Sebo and perhaps the surrounding area. Very impressive, the way that it rises up there and especially the way the hoods project up at the top there, as well as all the different types of stone which must come from the locality. And do you think it's big enough for someone to actually have hidden in it? Bonnie, Prince Charlie, for Charles? <laughs> I would think very much so. So what kind of state was the building in when Jackie and Chris bought it? Well, more or less derelict, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Especially upstairs. I mean, down here was more or less as it is now. Um, but upstairs was just a scary, spooky, dark, spider-ridden building. So what did you think about them when they bought it? I thought they were mad, really. There's not lot to take on. <laughs> the shop takes up the whole of the ground floor and is shut off from the rest of the house because of modern laws on drugs and medicines. So Chris and Jackie's front door is in the alley at the side. Despite the imposing look of the house, the living quarters are surprisingly small. Apart from a dank cellar, the two upper floors comprise just two rooms each. I'm on the um, top floor where there's the bathroom, and this is Chris and Jackie's bedroom, and there are some very dodgy floorboards in here. The earth literally moves every time you stand on these things, but Chris assures me in his capacity as structural engineer that they're safe. Also in here, there are these fantastic timbers that I know Mac's gonna love. It's really funny, you know, Johnny Depp and Paul Newman turned me on, but for Mac, it's wood. And um, it's also wood for Chris, he's into carpentry. And he tells me that he made this rocking horse to woo Jackie, and it obviously worked. This is the panelled room. Oh, see Juliet checking the floorboards upstairs. Mm, we'll get used to that. It's the room that really gives us the the biggest challenge, we don't quite know how to decorate it or, or what to do with it. Yes, because it's quite a, an odd mix. This oak panelling is very typical late 17th century. Now, I get the feeling with this pine panelling on here that it was probably introduced in the early 18th century. And they weren't too worried about it. They didn't mind having a bit of a bodged mm. job. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they painted 
this, right. this pine because you certainly would, mm. you know, I mean, it was never to be exposed. It's like, you know, stone work. I mean, they used to put lime plaster yes. on it, you know, to, to, to cover it. And we have this great idea that we should expose <laughs> all the natural. They'd probably you know, laugh if they could see it. They would. It? I mean, they would, well, they'd be horrified. They'd yeah. think, you know, because actually the last thing you did, even in your servants' quarters, mm. you painted, you know, you used the drab paints. Right. Um, because you just didn't want anybody to see that you had pine, because it was just regarded as cheap and nasty. Mac, Mac, come in here. I know you're going to love this. Oh, wow. This Just is... for you. <laughs> Look, Absolutely. stroking the wood. Absolutely, yeah. As ever, I knew you did. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I did. Oh, this is superb. Yes, it's beautiful. This is, this is a crack frame. This, uh, a crack frame is essentially because it comes down here and has the curve within it. But this is what's called a raised crack essentially for holding up the roof. And um, one thing I noticed, Mac, these marks. What are these marks on the wood? There's, There's one over there as well. Yeah, well, these actually are carpenter's marks. This really tells us that the roof timbers came in a prefabricated form. They were already prepared. And they get everything all assembled together. And, and then ship it in. Yeah, because this is a collar, you see. And this has got three, so that they know as they bring it in and assemble it, that this is the collar that goes with this particular They're lovely, piece of rough. Yeah. Don't lovely. you think it's a great piece of engineering, how it all slots together? It is. It's, it's, it's well thought out, well considered. The whole concept of actually building timber-framed houses is quite a, a craft and an art. So how old are these, Mac? Well, they can start um, certainly into the 14th century, and they continued around until about 1640. This is the first room that we've restored, which is now a kitchen. It used to be uh, just a room where they stored all the old bottles and just a complete mess, really. It's fantastic. And this is an absolutely amazing table. Yes, Chris made this. He absolutely adores wood. And that's the lovely spice cupboard, is it? Yes, that's right. We found the frame and door of this just on the floor here, covered in layers of paint and wallpaper, which we stripped off. Yes, yeah, it's a lovely oak, good butterfly hinges late 17th, early 18th century cupboard. And inside, there's still the original shelf. Oh, that was all here? That you was all there, yeah. Spices were, were more common than we think in the 17th century, so it's lovely to have it back in mm. where it was supposed to yeah. be. We have a mystery, it's our window, the inscription on the window there. Since one stone cuts the most obdurate glass, what need of two to pierce a tender lass? Well, it's certainly not one of the Lakeland poets. Mm. It seems to me that a bit of research would have to be done as to what it actually means. <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds a bit risque. Good heavens, Chris. This is tremendous. This is mysterious, atmospheric. It's fantastically great, this enormous fireplace here. We're at the, the bottom of the chimney that we saw from outside. That's right from the yard there. All this has been put in. Originally, there would have been the fire in the half here. In the this, middle? Yeah, yeah, this wouldn't have been here. You can see the scorch marks on the top here. So do they use this for cooking? Um, no, this is a copper. It's really a sort of washing machine, an 18th, 19th century washing machine that's been placed here. We've been fascinated to know, what's this hole here then? Uh, this is a bread oven. When uh, the hearth would have been blazing away, fuel would have been taken from it, put inside and got this baking pot, raked up the fuel, put in then the dough and everything ready for sort of the, making the bread, and when the bread was baked, it was then brought out. Right. There's another interesting bit, is that projection there, because that back wall rises at the end of your house. Just then, by the steps. Even curiouser, as Alice might have said, because the door's all blocked in as well, isn't it? Could this protruding wall be here for? Might this be where Bonnie Prince Charlie hid in 1745? This is like a lump of Wensley oh, there, I see. I'll stand on your piece of cheese and uh, have a look in there, Mac. All right. Seems to go back a long way. I'll have a look. It does. It. I reckon it must be uh, over two metres. Can't find the back. No, there's no hole. That means it's absolutely solid rubble. Hold on a moment, Chris. I heard What's some it? metal. Yeah, there it is. Heavens. Ah, looks like a penny. Oh, yes, look. Does that look like uh, Britannia? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see it. I can't see a date that looks as if it's rubbed off. I think we'll have to just clean this up. The coin wasn't all that was found. The shop's original Victorian furnishings were lost, but Jackie and Chris had discovered medicines and treatments dating back a hundred years and more. This is lovely. I mean, I love this. This green poison bottle with its ribbed side, mm. so that if you picked it up in the dark, you weren't going to swig something really horrible. That's right. And of course, the poison register. Which we still use now. Obviously, control drugs rather than poisons, although we still do do a few poisons. And this is a fantastic bottle, this Bristol mm. Blue. I mean, one of the best pieces of English glass making is Bristol Blue. About 1800 with this lovely... Um, handwritten script on it. Do you find many of these? No, no unfortunately, no. no. Like but not in that condition, you know, quite a few of them were broken. Yeah. And lots of pills too, noticing these little Medilax laxative pellets yes. coated in silver. Mm -hmm. mm, lethal, I should imagine. <laughs> <laughs> silver got to be probably worse than the laxative, yeah. really, what you're, what you're taking. And also lots of things for baby. This is mm. all with Lorna in mind. This, well, is it? absolutely now, yes. It's the, going to be a heavy for presents. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, rest reliever, Lorna. Oh yes, very useful. Thank you. <laughs> Need quite a strong hand on the breast reliever. <laughs> I hope the baby's not too hungry either, because it's going to take, take a while. But it just shows you here all the sort of things that, mm. that would have been in the shop, and not only for humans, but, but animals too. The yeah. piglet anemia paste. <laughs> These would look really wonderful displayed mm. yeah. on traditional fittings. It's a dream, I think. <laughs> for many years, the pharmacist was Fred Lowis, and his Victorian style shop was a wonder yeah. to the small children of Sedba between the walls. Bye. So, you've been coming in uh, the shop for some years now? Oh, all my life, yes. And I'm 78, and I've come since I was a very small girl. And um, I can remember the druggist counter down there. Yes. And Mr. Fred Lowry's quite well. What sort of chap was he? Well, I think he was short and, and plumpish, and but somebody told me that he had a moustache, but I can't remember the moustache. Right. He was a sort of kind fellow, I think. But how long had the Lowry's family lived above the chemists? Neighbours directed us to the Sedba local history room. This is the census return from 1881, and it shows that 14 people were living in your house. 14 people? At that time. It's going to be absolutely jam-packed. Can you imagine it? 14. The head of the household was a Charles Lowis, and he was married to Mary, and they had 11 children all running around your little place. And one of those children was Frederick Lowis, uh, our Fred. Chemist Apprentice. It was too much to resist. The lost Victorian shop interior was what Jackie and Chris were yearning for. Time to turn back the clock. So, Neville, the beginning of our Victorian transformation for the chemist. What are you going to do? Well, first of all, you've brought that in, and we've got lots more where this came from. Where? I stumbled on this little antique shop, and she's got these cabinets which she used for displaying things in. At this moment in time, she doesn't want to sell them, but everybody's got a prize. The 1851 census revealed our shop had also been a draper's. Here was an important link with the very business that made Sedba famous, the cloth industry. Then a breakthrough. A deed from 1820 showed that a Joseph Dover manufacturer occupied the house. Dover was one of the most important men in Sedba's history. He was one of the first to bring industry and with it prosperity to the town at the end of the 18th century. Here we had the answer to our 13 windows mystery. Above the draper's shop, our house was a hive of industry with up to a dozen weavers working for Joseph Dover. You see where the projecting slates come out here? That's where the weaving windows would have been put in. High up, up on the upper story there, just where your bedroom is, getting the maximum amount of light. And these were introduced into houses so that the workers could sit at their hand looms there, weaving away getting the yarn into cloth, and they'd be at it all day from 5 a.m. until 8 o'clock at night. Whenever there was light, this bricked in part here would have been given access for materials which we could have been brought up on a little gantry, like a little crane sticking outside, and they would have been taken taken into there. And round the corner here, here is our blocked-in doorway. And this is where the steps lead down into the cellar, which have been used for storage. And then there's also the fireplace with the copper. 
and that would have been used for dyeing the cloth. Right, so this was in fact like a mini factory and each floor being used for completely different things. So right up at the top we have the weavers making the cloth, down here is the dyeing and in between in your panelled room is where Joseph Dover, who was the boss, sat with his office. In a local antiquarian bookshop, Judith uncovered a rare insight into the kind of man he was. Here we've got a really fascinating find. This is a ledger actually written by Joseph Dover, um, listing all sorts of business transactions and family matters. He's obviously a very shrewd man. The lovely letter here where he's lent a loom to someone, and you just see the importance of something like this loom because he's very upset this loom has then been lent to someone else. And he says, I do not remember that you had any orders from us to let the loom go to Richard Alderton, and it was to you that it was lent, and you will be the man that I must check to for it. But as well as all these letters about buying wool, there's, there's quite a poignant letter here to his brother announcing the death of, of three of his children from a, from a violent fever. And he says, It is my painful duty to inform you the loss I have had in my family, one son and two daughters, all in the course of a few days, Robert and Mary were both interred in grave on Monday the 22nd and Dorothy on Tuesday the 30th of last month of a violent fever which had broke out in this county. It appears the doctors does not understand the complaint as I've had every advice that laid in my power. This fever that swept through the valley in 1824 could have been scarlet fever, could even have been something like flu, something that today you could go to the chemist shop and buy some cure would decimate a family like this and three little children dead. But our house and shop was only one end of the 18th century cloth production line. The other end was Hebblethwaite Mill, built in 1792, two miles out of town. We'd been told the mill had been abandoned for years and we weren't sure if we'd find anything left. It is quite strange to imagine, isn't it, that uh, this would have been a really well-worn route by uh, pack horses coming along here yeah. carrying the raw wool. And it's kind of bizarre, I think, to, to imagine that uh, what is now a re really sort of quiet backwater would have been really throbbing mm. with industry. About 20 people worked at the mill. Right. It was basically they'd bring the raw wool on these pack horses down there and uh, then it would be cleaned and scrubbed and uh, spun and then sent back to places like your house oh, right. in Main Street. I mean, you, you, you wonder why perhaps they didn't build it. Yeah. Hey, look. Do you think that's it over there? Yeah, it could Well, be. there's something. Something there. Let's have a look. Let's go and have a look. And here we are, the ruins of Hebblethwaite Mill. It's really small. It's tiny, isn't yeah. it? Well, it's very narrow, but I guess it would have gone up a lot higher. But this is the very first one in the area. It sort of heralded the Industrial yeah. Revolution. But there were still mysteries we were no nearer solving, so we called in local backup. Hello, Roger Bingham here. Roger, we've got a couplet on, on the window here, and we hear you're the man who can tell us about it. Since one stone cuts the most obdurate glass, what need of two to pierce a tender last? Balls. <laughs> Stones are a name for the motive force behind that which pierced the female body. Goodness. I suppose that sounds quite shocking to us today, but it was done in 1819 and that wasn't so odd. Well, it is three months before Queen Victoria was born. This is the period of the Regency Buck, uh, the Georgian dandy. Um, in any case, it's expressing sentiments which resolve the hills and which you can see as graffiti in the public lavatories of Pompeii or those outside in Sedbur at this moment. Roger, there is a local rumour that says that Bonnie Prince Charlie may well have hidden in this chimney. Well, a good place to hide. The chimney was there at the time and there'd almost certainly be room for him because uh, there would be probably a smoking chamber to cure mutton and ham in the chimney. But sorry, Jackie. Bonnie Prince Charlie couldn't have stayed here. The nearest he got to here was 15 miles away in Kendal. And we have an almost hour by hour account of his itinerary through Cumbria. After all, it was the media event of the time. We know where he stayed, where he slept, and whom he slept with even. 
and uh, he brought three sleeping companions with him, a Mrs. Murray, a Mrs. Cameron, and an Irishman, John O'Sullivan, because like his great-great-grandfather, James I, he was bisexual, hence the origin of his nickname. Bonnie Prince Charlie, unfortunately, was a pejorative term, uh, as one might say, pretty boy Charlie. Now the trail had gone cold, and we'd run out of historical records to help us. Then we heard a rumour that a local farmer had important documents under his bed. Inaccessible and remote Felgate Farm might just hold a further clue. Kevin, we've come to a bit of a dead end as far as our documents go, but I think you're the man that can help us. Tell us what you've got relating to our house. Well, we've got a very exciting uh, deed here from 1780, and we've got this description of the property. Um, there's a brew house under the kitchen. They're brewing their own ale, of course. There's a pump and pump house, coal house, wood house, peat house. They're still getting peat off the fell at that stage. Right, but for for, that's for fuel, yes. That's why you've got this big chimney behind. That's the sort of fuel you would burn on a fire like that. Two swine coats, he's keeping pigs there. A bog house, of course. A <laughs> toilet. Mm -hmm. Still got that. Then you've got... In view of the connection with the weaving trade that you've established already, there's a garden and a bleaching green. Where they bleached the cloth. That's right, presumably. where they laid it out, yeah. Kevin also helped us trace other documents which showed that before Dover, our house had still been a place of work, but this time in pre-industrial Sedba, more of a cottage industry. In the first half of the 18th century, our shop was a hosier's, selling knitted socks, stockings and caps. It seemed our house was reflecting Sedba's development right across the centuries. Before the advent of the weaving industry, knitting dominated the life of the Dales. So what sort of a place would our house have been? Now the tradition is dying, but Judith tracked down two knitters who echo the habits of two and a half centuries ago. They're known locally as the Terrible Knitters. Let us coast the milk and calves the feet and plenty in the other side. For young time tell the referee all to leave and die. Yes, the whole purpose of the songs were really to make you knit faster. So why were they called terrible knitters? Because they're the best knitters of all the dairies. And we would say terrible wet day. That would be a very, very wet day. And so these Knitters, they were so good, they were called terrible. So did everyone knit? Yes, men, women, boys and girls. And mostly they had to do some knitting before they went out to play when they came back from school. Takes me back to my childhood in the Scottish borders. That's what we used to do. We had to, knitting was the only thing we were allowed to do on a Sunday. Yes. We weren't allowed to read, but we could knit. Oh. <laughs> so... That's no, you weren't allowed to knit on a Sunday. Uh, you went, ah. Oh. And why did they knit? Well, they knitted because uh, the farms were very small and not much other work to do. And it helped to eke out the living. Do you think I could be a trainee? Yes. Knitter? Yes, I think you're doing very well. We've got a recruit. <laughs> we'll label you a terrible knitter. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, that's pretty good. Well, was it a barking cry? Ba, ba, ba. So, Jackie, after a lot of hard work, particularly you and Chris, you have this little corner of a Victorian pharmacy. Yeah, it's absolutely fabulous, isn't it? Especially the drug run here. I mean, it's a lovely late Victorian drug run and getting more difficult to find. Yeah, but there's places, that you, can, you know, you can find these things. You, you just have a bit of passion. You can source anything. I can, but not many drug runs as good as that. And I love the, the scales behind glass so that you know, the wind didn't affect the balance. Brilliant. What do you think, Lorna? Oh, I think it's great. Well, we're just wondering what outfit we might be required to wear now. Mop caps and nipped in waist, perhaps? <laughs> bit difficult yeah, for me at the moment. What would you think, Chris? I think it looks really good. And another little mystery, the coin that Mac and Chris right. found in the, in in the cellar. cellar. 
It's minted in 1694. It's a copper halfpenny with the conjoined busts of William and Mary. And in mint condition, about 200 pounds. Really? But I mean, really, this, yeah. in this, it's just lovely to have it because mm. it was probably put in that wall when that was built right. as a token for good luck. Well, I'd love to buy your conjoined busts. <laughs> <laughs> the coin, the roof timbers, and the panelled room. Everything was pointing to the 17th century. Even the neighbouring houses confirmed a building boom at the time. But Mac wasn't happy, and hidden details in the bathroom proved things weren't that simple. I was snooping around, and this is what I found. This is a great corbel, comes straight out of the wall, and it's supporting this hood canopy of a fireplace. Right, we think it's part of next door's fireplace, but the other part is in the bedroom. This is the other half, Mac. This is the most remarkable and astonishing thing. You thought that this fireplace was... Next door's. It's yours. Really? On the yes. top floor, though? On the top floor, which means that this is of considerable age, much older than indeed our crack. In fact, the crack has actually been brought down and put in it. Nobody goes and puts a crack over the top of a fireplace, and yet it's been brought in here. So it stopped being a fireplace at the time that this roof was brought down. It means the roof was higher, too. That's absolutely fantastic. And we just dismissed it as nothing next door's fireplace. So the newly discovered fireplace meant our house was taller and older than its neighbours. In fact, a detached building. This had dramatic repercussions, suddenly pushing things further back in history and into a very different, less civilised world. The thing that had impressed us from the start, the solidity and imposing presence of the house, had held the answer all along. OK, so you two are probably wondering why we brought you up here. Yes, yeah. we are. <laughs> but I'm wondering why we're up here as well. Well, especially the weather. I think the weather's perfect, you know, because a lot of the history of your house is actually associated with days like this. There's bleakness and these fells and the mists and the rain. And it was a dangerous land. I mean, it really was. There was border reavers and, and really quite a desperate place to live. It's from medieval times. And that started us thinking about your house. We've got the modern Bailey Castle at one end of said that, which is a Norman date, so that's sort of 11th century. And then off to one side is the church behind the trees in the background there. And the main street in between, and in the middle of the main street, is your house, a really significant position. And what we've got is a medieval house. Absolutely staggering. The date? Go on, tell us. <laughs> 14th century? Oh, <laughs> no, All amazing. because of a corbel fireplace. <laughs> yes. Absolutely speechless yeah. for once. That's unbelievable. The house turns. <laughs> Shortly after filming, Lorna gave birth to a seven and a half pound boy called Ben. Mother and son are both doing well.